Okay, so um, I'm going to go over this last little bit with respect to NMR um, in this video. So hopefully you guys are watching this and you're actually paying attention. Um, so we had talked already about each shape or each signal in the NMR spectrum having a couple of different um, characteristics, right? So the first one that we talked about um, was the chemical shift. So chemical shift we can abbreviate as delta. This had to do with the overall magnetic field that each various proton felt, right? And this had to do with um, inductive effects, inductive, as well as that diamagnetic anisotropy, right? So the presence of pi bonds, et cetera, okay? So that was gonna give us an idea of where the proton was at, what type of electronic environment, was it near um, electronegative atoms, et cetera, okay? The second characteristic that we talked about was the integration integration and again this was the area under the curve right and so this was going to give us some indication of the actual number of protons that were giving rise to the signal right so um, we can integrate under every signal and essentially know how many protons are responsible for creating that signal um, which is very very helpful okay so this last one, or this last characteristic of each signal in the NMR spectra is something called multiplicity, um, or what we're going to also call spin-spin um, coupling or spin-spin splitting, right? And this is going to have to do with the overall shape of our signal, right? So this is probably the most important information that we can come away from with respect to an NMR signal, because what this is going to do is it's going to tell us about the other protons that are nearby our proton in our signal, okay? And hopefully I can explain what I mean by that. But this is going to give us a good indication of who is nearby um, each proton that we're dealing with in our NMR spectrum so that we can essentially piece together the overall structure of the molecule, okay? All right, so first off, let's talk about what I mean by shape. Um, and so with respect to shape, I've been alluding to, when we've been looking at our little NMR spectrums, I've been alluding to the fact that sometimes um, signals will look like just one peak, right? But sometimes I've been calling signals that have, let's say, two peaks or even three peaks. I've also been calling these guys individual signals, right? And so what we're talking about when we're talking about shape is if this is a signal and this is giving rise or coming from um, one set of non-equivalent protons, then why don't we see um, a single peak for all of them, right? Why in some signals are we seeing two peaks, in some signals we're seeing three peaks, and so on, okay? So before we get started on that, I want to talk about or define what we actually call these various numbers of peaks, right? So if we do have only one peak for a signal, this is something that we call a, sig a singlet. Um, if we have a signal, though, that is split into two peaks, so two different peaks, and these guys were of equal height, then we call that a doublet. If we have three peaks where we have a one to two to one ratio, we call that a triplet, and so on. Okay, so I'm going to utilize these words, quartet, quintet, sextet, septet, um, as I move through this. So just note, if I refer to a quartet, I'm referring to a, a signal that has four peaks, and they integrate into a one to, is it one to four to four ratio? I think, yeah, but just note, that's what I'm meaning by quartet, quintet, sextet, septet, etc. okay? All right, so now the question is, what is going to take a, sig a signal in the NMR spectrum and turn it into something like a doublet or a triplet, etc.? All right, so now, what is the actual basis behind all of this? So now let's imagine that we have um, a molecule, and we are really, really, really interested in looking at the signal for HA, so proton A in this overall molecule, okay? So we're interested in the signal for this guy, okay? And again, its chemical shift is gonna be determined by the types of atoms, um, electronegative atoms that it's around, um, also by the pi electron that it's around, et cetera. So that's gonna be you know, determined in terms of chemical shift, okay? Now, let's imagine that we're you know, doing our little NMR and we've got our magnet and it's being applied to HA and we know that HA is going to split into its alpha or beta spin states, right? And that difference in energy is going to essentially determine the chemical shift, right? Now, we also have to understand that HA, especially in this particular compound, is nearby HB. And what's really important to note here is that HA and HB are non-equivalent. So these are different 
protons, okay? They're not equivalent to one another, okay? So HA, HB. All right, we're still interested in looking at the signal of HA, right? But we've applied our magnetic field now, and we know that HB has its own little magnetic field itself, right? So when we apply that magnetic field, HB can either be, um, let's say, the alpha spin state, right? So we can either have its magnetic field in line with the magnetic field that we've applied, or it could have a beta spin state. It can be against and opposing the field that we've applied. So this would be our alpha, and this will be our beta, right? And the minute we apply that magnetic field, HB is going to take on one of those two states, alpha or beta, okay? Okay, so now let's say in one molecule, um, HB takes on the alpha spin state. So in one molecule that we're looking at in the sample, HB is alpha, okay? Now, that is its own little magnetic field, right? That is its own little magnet, it's its own little magnetic field, and because of that, HA is going to feel that tiny little magnetic field that HB has now taken on, okay? And so because of that, because again, we have this external magnetic field, and we have all these other factors that are uh, affecting the overall signal of HA, this guy being in line with our external magnetic field is also going to affect HA, okay? So for this molecule, because HB, who's right nearby, has a little magnetic moment, HA is going to feel that little magnetic moment, and it's going to have its signal split a little bit larger comparatively to if HB wasn't there, right? So we have a molecule, we're looking at the signal for HA, HB has aligned with that field, and so HA feels that, and its signal between alpha and beta is split just a little bit more, because it's feeling a little bit more of that magnetic field, okay? So that's one molecule, okay? And another molecule, on the other hand, when we apply our external magnetic field, let's say HB actually takes on the beta spin state, right? So for this guy, um, because HB took on that beta spin state, HA feels the presence of that beta spin state, right? Feels that opposing magnetic field. And because of that, HA doesn't feel as strong as a magnetic field, right? So its um, alpha beta spin state energy is going to be a little bit smaller comparatively, okay? So these are the two possible outcomes. HA is either near an HB that is aligned with the field, or it's near an HB that is aligned against the field. And so because of that, instead of getting um, just one signal, one peak out, we're gonna get instead that peak split into two, right? We're gonna get that peak split into um, slightly higher downfield and slightly lower downfield, right? So we'll be at one guy where we have a little bit higher of an energy state and we'll get one guy that has a little bit tiny lower of an energy state. And so because of this, we get what is called a doublet because there are two possible outcomes. HB, who's nearby HA, is either with the field. If it's with the field, we get a little bit larger splitting, right? And so we get a little bit higher of a chemical shift. If we're near an HB that's aligned against the field, then we get a little bit smaller of a splitting and we will absorb at a little bit lower of a chemical shift, right? And so the big thing to note about this is the fact that HB 50% of the time is going to align against and 50% of the time is going to align with. So this is an equal probability and that's why the two peaks here are equal in magnitude. This is what we get when we get a doublet, okay? Okay, so just note that here, HA, who we're interested in, this is his signal that is being split, was nearby only one non-equivalent proton. And when we were nearby only one non-equivalent proton, we end up getting two peaks as a result. And again, that two peaks is called a doublet. Okay, so what's next? All right, so that was HA nearby only one non-equivalent proton, right? What if we had HA? Again, the one that we're actually interested, what if in a different molecule, it was nearby um, HB, right? But now it was nearby two non-equivalent HBs, okay? So again, these two, HB, HB is non-equivalent and different than HA, but these two guys are equivalent with respect to one another. Okay, so these guys are equivalent protons, all right? 
Okay, so similar thing. We're interested in the signal for HA, and we're interested in the signal for HA in the presence of these two non-equivalent protons, HB. Okay, now same exact thing that we were talking about before. When we apply our magnetic field, right, there's a couple of different outcomes for what HB is going to do that's going to affect HA, right? So, for example, let's say we apply our magnetic field. Let me get rid of this guy. And when we apply that magnetic field, we find in one molecule that um, this HB aligns in the alpha spin state, and this HB also aligns in the alpha spin state, right? So in one of the molecules, HB, both of the HBs are aligned alpha, right? And so because of that, HA is going to feel both of those magnetic fields, and it's going to be split. Its alpha beta spin state is going to be split a lot more if they weren't there. Okay, comparatively. Not a lot more, but more than if they weren't there. Okay, so that's one possible outcome. In another molecule, let's say HB, we'll call this HB1, we'll call this HB2. Let's say HB1 aligns with, right, so with the external magnetic field. But in HB2, we actually see this guy um, in the beta spin state, and so it, it aligns against, right? So because of that, um, for this situation where we have one that is with, one that is against, we'll have a little bit lower of an energy spacing because we'll have a little bit smaller of that external magnetic field between alpha and beta, okay? All right, so then in another scenario, let's say that H1 aligns against in the beta state, but then HB2 aligns with in the alpha state, right? So again, this is a different, like, uh, I guess, a different arrangement of these two different spin states, but the overall effect is going to be one against and one with, and so we're going to get the exact same energy splitting in that situation between alpha and beta. Again, we're looking at HA. This is HA's alpha beta that we're looking at, okay? And then finally, let's say that in the last molecule that we look at, we actually find that both HBs, HB2 and HB1, uh, are both aligned beta, right? So they're both opposing the external magnetic field. And so because of that, we will get a, a smaller comparatively uh, splitting of the two spin states for HA, and we'll get a little bit, or we'll get absorbance at a little bit lower of a frequency, okay? So now in this situation, we had one of these guys where we had both HB's with, we had two different situations where we had one with, one against, and then we had one situation where we had both of the two HB's against, okay? And so what this turns into, instead of, again, one big signal, is we get a signal where we have a one to two to one ratio that's representing, again, let me try to illustrate this, this guy is representing this one, whereas both of these two, the width, or both of these two, pardon me, this guy and this guy are representing the one width and one against, and that's represented in the big uh, one to two to one ratio. And then finally, this guy is represented by this guy, right? So because there were two ways that we could arrange both of those protons for HB as one width and one against, we'll get a large peak right here in the middle. That's twice the size of the two peaks on the outside, okay? And so this overall is what we call a triplet. This is a triplet. And again, a triplet, we're looking at three peaks, and they have to have that one to two to one ratio. Okay, so for this guy, we had HA, and this is HA signal that will be split into a triplet. It was nearby one, two protons, right? So when we have two nearby non-equivalent protons, we end up getting three peaks. And again, they're going to split in that one to two to one ratio. And then finally, if we consider what happens when, again, we are looking at HA, and we are looking at it in terms of three different HBs. Again, these three HBs are equivalent with respect to one another, but they're non-equivalent with respect to HA. If we went through all of the different um, combinations of how HB how its spin state could affect HA, what we would find is we would find one situation where all three of them could be against the field. We would have one situation where one would be with the field and two against the field. And we would have three situations where two would be with the field, one would be against, 
And then we would only have one situation where both or all three of those um, little magnetic moments would be with the field, right? So if there were three nearby non-equivalent protons, we would end up with a signal that would have one to three to three to one, right? Because again, if we went through all the different combinations, we would get three combinations where one would be against or one would be with, two would be against. We'd get three different combinations where two would be with, one would be against, and there would only be one way that we could arrange them where we'd have all of them with or all of them against. So three nearby neighbors ends up with a signal that has four peaks, and that four peaks is what we call a quartet. Okay, okay, so hopefully I've been trying to allude to this pattern that we're getting out to the side. But at the end of the day, if we had one nearby neighbor, we got two, we had two, we had got three, we got three, we got four. Um, the number of peaks of peaks for a given signal is going to follow what we call the n plus one rule, where n is the number of nearby non-equivalent protons. I'm going to define what I mean by nearby in a second. Non-equivalent, let's just write this well. Non-equivalent protons. Okay. Okay, so nearby non-equivalent protons... If we want to know how many peaks our signal is going to be split into, we need to count the number of nearby non-equivalent protons, and then we need to add one to it, okay? Okay, so a couple of things to note. This n plus one rule, or this splitting, or the, what we're going to call this multiplicity, has a couple names. It's something that's called spin-coupling. spin, spin uh, coupling. So these protons couple together. That's why we get this overall effect. It's also called spin-spin splitting. Because the overall effect, or what we see in the NMR spectrum, is the actual splitting of the signal. Now, a couple important things to note about it. You have, you're only going to see this spin-spin coupling, spin-spin splitting, when the protons are non-equivalent with respect to one another. If you have equivalent protons, equivalent protons are not going to split each other. You're only going to get one signal from equivalent protons, okay? So this has to, this only is gonna occur, we're only gonna see this splitting pattern when we're dealing with non-equivalent protons that are nearby, okay? Number two, what do I mean by nearby? So I'll say nearby or neighbor, neighbor protons. What we mean by that is that you're only gonna see splitting between protons that are two to three sigma bonds away. That's a big characteristic thing that you need to know, okay? Um, so, for example, let's say that I had a molecule here where I had a proton, proton A, let's say, and it was nearby proton B. And again, the most important thing with respect to this is that these are non-equivalent. So, these are non-equivalent, -equi okay? Now, A with respect to B is only one two sigma bonds away, so we would see splitting here. There would be a split, a splitting pattern, okay? This is what we would call um, geminal protons as well because they're on the same carbon, so they come, they're like, they're Gemini, they're twins, they come from the same carbon. Okay, another situation where you would see splitting is if we had something like HA here, and it was nearby HB here, okay? So these, again, are non-equivalent. We're looking at whether or not they're going to actually split each other. They're going to couple with each other. If we count the number of sigma bonds between H, A, and C, we have one, we've got two, we've got three. So this we would also see splitting. So for both of these situations, you would see splitting, okay? Now, a situation where you wouldn't see splitting is where you have H, A, and H, B is way over here, okay? So if we count the number of sigma bonds, we've got one, two, three, four. So because this is four sigma bonds away, you will not see splitting here. So this is no splitting. No splitting in situations like these, okay? Or five or six or however many far apart they are, okay? Okay, so spin, spin, coupling, spin, spin, splitting. It's only going to occur when we are two to three sigma bonds away from each other. And then also, I do give you the list of 
the uh, multiplicity of the peaks, so doublets, triplets, quartets, and the actual integration of the um, different components of each signal, right? So in the triplet, it was a one to two to one ratio. In the quartet, that was one to three to three to one. We didn't go over what happens when there are four or five or six neighboring protons, um, but just note that it follows a kind of general pattern. I forget what this is. If this is like Pascal's triangle or something, I think it is. There's like a mathematical pattern that it eventually follows that I don't know, obviously, at this point in time. But just note, you're looking for quintet, you're looking for like a peak nearby a peak that's bigger than it, nearby a central peak, and then they go back out, right? So I'll show you what I mean by all of these in a second. Okay, so now we're going to do an example, and then we're going to go through a practice problem. Um, so in this example, we want to determine the multiplicity for each signal in the following molecule. Okay, so again, the first step in doing any of this is determining the number of signals in the molecule. All right, so I'm gonna start off on our left over here. And for NMR, for H1 NMR, proton NMR, we are looking for protons, right? And so again, with all of our bond line structures, we never draw the protons on. So I'm gonna start out here at the left. I'm gonna note that um, out on the end here, I have a methyl group, right? So this is a methyl group, and we already know that all methyl protons are equivalent with respect to one another, right? So these guys are all going to be equivalent, but we should also note in this isopropyl group, they're also equivalent with these guys, right? Because this bond can rotate. If it rotated, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. They're in the exact same chemical environment, so all of these guys are equivalent. And we'll call this signal HA. So we'll call this HA. And all these guys can be little A's, etc. Okay? Okay. So then, if these guys are all equivalent to one another, we move on. Um, we'll note that there is a proton right here at this carbon. Um, it is non equivalent to the HA's, obviously. They're in very different electronic environments. Um, it is by itself, we would call this a methine proton. And so we will call this guy HB. So that's our second signal. As we move on to the next carbon, there are um, no protons here, so we can ignore that. We move on to the next carbon. Um, we note that there are two implied protons here. There is no chiral center in this molecule, right? So both of these protons are equivalent to one another. So we can go ahead and highlight them. These guys are equivalent to one another. We'll call them HC. As we move on, we've got two more protons out here. Um, they are different from HC, right? HC was right near a carbon that had an oxygen on it. This is now, that was alpha. This is now beta to that. So HC is not equivalent to these new protons. Um, we'll call these guys HD. So these are unique. They're not equivalent to HC, they're HD. Um, as we move out, we can note this carbon has no protons on it. It's attached to entire methyl groups. And overall, this group on the end is called a terbutyl group. Um, so all of these guys end as methyl groups, right? So they all have protons. And most importantly, on them, all of these guys are equivalent with respect to one another, right? So all of these guys in this terbutyl group, these guys are all equivalent protons, Okay, so we're at A, B, C, D. We'll call these guys H, E. So this will be our H, E signal. Okay, so that's number one. We have to figure out how many signals we're actually going to see. Number two, now we can worry about the multiplicity of each. Okay, so we're going to start over here with H, A. So H, A, and considering its multiplicity. Um, so note that each H here these guys are all equivalent protons. They're not going to split one another, right? So we're only concerned with the number of protons that are two to three sigma bonds from HA, okay? So if I started, let's say, out here on this HA, so this guy, and I counted one in, and I counted one over, so that's one, two, and I counted this guy, this is three, this is the only proton, HB is the only proton that is within two to three sigma bonds from all of these HAs, okay? So because of that, the only thing that is going to split this signal for HA is just HB, 
okay? And again, we're going to follow that n plus 1 rule, where n is the number of nearby non-equivalent protons. That is only satisfied by this guy. We're three sigma bonds away. So for this, we would have only 1 plus 1, which gives us 2. And so this entire signal for HA would be split into a doublet, two peaks. Okay, and what's important to note is that if you actually saw it, right, we would have a doublet for HA, and it would have an integral of six protons, right, because again, this signal has six protons that are making it up, right, it is being split by only one, that's why we see um, the doublet, the multiplicity pattern that we do, okay, okay, so now we'll move on to HB, so HB is just this one little guy by himself, right? But if we're looking for the number of nearby non-equivalent protons, HB we just counted was 1 to 2 to 3 away from HA, right? And when we count this, we count all of the HAs, right? So it's not just this guy. It's also this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy, okay? If we went the other way for HB, trying to look for other protons that it would couple with, if we went... 1, 2, 3, 4, HC is too far away from HB to couple with it, okay? So we won't actually get any coupling over here. And so HB will only couple with HA. And again, if we're following the N plus 1 rule, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 HAs that HB will couple with. And so this is 6 plus 1, which gives us our 7, right? So HB overall would have a signal that is split into seven separate peaks. This is called a septet. And a septet would have a one to something to something to something to something to something to something ratio. Right, so it's three little tiny peaks raising to a peak, and then we move back out. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven different peaks, right? Now, what's important to note here is that in the actual signal, in the actual NMR spectrum for this guy, this would have seven peaks, but when we integrated it, it would only integrate to one proton, right? Because there's only one proton that's actually giving rise to the signal. That signal is being split into seven separate peaks. Okay, so then we'll move on to HC, move this guy out here. So HC, um, again, we're looking for protons that are two to three sigma bonds. We know already that HC back to HB was four sigma bonds away, so we don't even consider anything on the left-hand side. Again, we're not gonna, they don't split each other, so we don't have to consider that, but they are gonna be split by, if I get a red here, we've got one, two, three. So they will be split by HD and HD only, right? And so it's going to be both of the HDs. So for HC, if we're following the N plus 1 rule, there are 1, 2 HDs. 2 plus 1 is 3. So this would give us our triplet. And when we actually saw the peak for that, it would be a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. And again, this would integrate into 3, or pardon me, 2 protons. Integration would be 2 protons giving rise to this HC signal. Same thing for HD. Right, so for HD, we have one, two, three. So HC is gonna be split by HC. If we go the opposite way though, one, two, three, four, we're not gonna be split by HE, right? So we're only gonna see splitting from HC. Again, there's one, two HCs. So N plus one, two plus one equals three. So HD would also be a triplet and it would also be one to two to one ratio, and it would integrate into two protons. And then finally, HE. So HE, there's a bunch of them, right? There ends up being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine different protons. They don't split each other because they're all equivalent, right? And if we go back for HE, we find one, two, three, four, right? So the nearest proton that could split it is four sigma bonds away. So because of that, for HE, um, N plus one, N here is zero. There are no protons nearby that can split this. So zero plus one gives us a one. So we're gonna find that all of these guys are just gonna be a singlet. One single peak, and that one single peak 
is going to integrate into nine protons. Okay, so um, go ahead and try these below. Uh, I want you to determine the multiplicity for each signal in these two molecules. You'll find some patterns here um, that will emerge long term. Um, hopefully they'll start to emerge quickly so that uh, you can easily see the type of signals given the type of uh, structure in a molecule. Okay, so we'll start over here with the first one on this guy. Um, so we'll start out left. We do have protons out here. These, is, uh, these are methyl protons, so these guys are all going to be equivalent with respect to one another. And again, we'll call this signal HA. Um, as we move in at the next carbon, there's no protons. At this carbon, there are protons. There are two. So we'll call these guys, there's no chiral center in the molecule, so that's nice. We'll call these guys HB. So it'll be HB. There's an oxygen, and then we move on to two more protons. Again, they are different from the original HB, and they are equivalent with respect to one another. So we'll call these guys HC. And then as we move out to the end, we have a methyl group. There's no axis of symmetry in this molecule. There's no plane of symmetry. And so these guys will all be equivalent to one another. And we'll call them HD. Let's go ahead and write over that again. Okay, so now multiplicity for the signal. All right, we're going to start with HA. So HA, again, for multiplicity, so I usually abbreviate this M, we're looking for um, nearby protons that are non-equivalent, that are within two to three sigma bonds away. So if we start by counting in, we have one sigma bond, we've got two sigma bonds, we've got three sigma bonds, and then we've got, at the very end here, four sigma bonds, okay? So because the near closest nearby neighbor protons are four sigma bonds away, there will be no splitting with um, HB. They will not couple with one another. Um, so there's no splitting there, like I just said. Um, and because equivalent protons, all these HAs, don't split one another, um, if we go to our N plus one, one rule, HA N plus one, there are zero plus one. So we're going to get a peak of one or a singlet. Okay, so finally, so next we move on to HB. So HB we know is not going to be coupled by HA because we've already counted 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. So we're not going to get any splitting on this side. If we go the other way, we go 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, we're also not going to see splitting. So here for HB, we have N plus 1, so 0 plus 1. We're also going to get a singlet. So then as we move out to HC... HC is nearby somebody. We have one, two, three. So HC will be split by HD. There's one, two, three HDs. So for HC, we've got three plus one, which gives us four. This is a quartet. And then finally for HD, we know HD will get split. One, two, three will get split by HC. There's one, two, H C's. So for H D, in terms of multiplicity, we get two plus one, which gives us a triplet. Okay, so moving over, that's the first molecule. Now we'll go on to B. So similar thing, we've got three protons out on the end here. This is a methyl group, so they're all equivalent with respect to one another. There is no protons here. There is one proton here. Uh, there are three protons here. There are two protons here. There are no protons here. And then there are nine protons out on this terbutyl group, out on this terminal terbutyl group. 
I'll go ahead and just draw those in. One, two, three. Okay, so that is the signals. So now let's talk about the splitting pattern that we could expect. Um, we'll start out to the left. So these guys we'll call HA. They're not going to split one another. And then if we look for nearby neighbors, we've got one, two, three, four would be the next nearby neighbor. So because of that, this methyl group HA is isolated. And we would expect a zero plus one, which would give us a singlet. So these guys are a singlet. As we move on, we'll go to this guy next. So uh, this is a methine proton. It's by itself. But now there's something that's different that's going to happen here, right? So comparatively, if we count in, we've got one. So we've got one, two, three. Ugh. So it's... Three bonds from, what do we call these guys? So I guess if this was, I guess if we call this guy HB, these guys would be HCs, okay? So we're three bonds from HB to HC. We're also one, two, three bonds to what we'll call HD, okay? So HB is going to have kind of a complex signal. We'll talk about this in a second. In general, though, you're going to count these guys as the same, that they're going to have the same overall effect. So we've got one, two, three, four, five that are going to split HB. So this is five plus one, which gives us six. So this is a sextet. That's HB. If we move on to HC, so HC is only going to be, we've got one, two, three it's only going to be split by this one HB, right? So we have one plus one, which gives us two. HC is going to be a doublet. And then same thing for HD. If we move HD up here, right? So HD, if we count, we've got one, two, three. If we go the other way, one, two, three, four, doesn't count. So HD will also just be one plus one which is two, which is a doublet. And then finally, as we get out here, all of these tert butyl protons, all of these guys, all of these guys, we'll call these HE. Um, we already counted, trying to count N for HD. So this was one, two, three, four. So there is nobody that's going to split HE. So because of that, all nine of those protons would be one peak. They would be a singlet. Okay. All right. Hopefully that is clear uh, with respect to actual problems. Um, we're going to show in a second what happened here with HB. Um, how sometimes this can get obscured a little bit because it was being split by both, by two different sets of non-equivalent protons. Um, and then after that, we'll move into how we can actually utilize this. Okay, so we're going to cover a couple um, just kind of cleanup topics just to um, finish out this idea behind coupling. All right, so when you have protons that are coupling in a molecule, um, they're going to have what we call a coupling constant, or another word for that is a J value, okay? And it's essentially going to be a measure of how much um, their interaction is actually splitting the signal or splitting the overall peaks, okay? Um, so, for example, if we have an ethyl group here where we have um, HAs, HAs are equivalent, um, and we also have HBs. HBs are equivalent. They're both splitting each other. HA and HB are going to share a coupling constant, right? And we call that, or we abbreviate that J. And because it's between these two protons, we'll call this JAB. It's the coupling constant between um, the HAs and the HBs, okay? All right, so if we were looking at the splitting pattern that we would expect here, um, HA, which is a methylene group, is being split by one, two, three protons in HB. 
So 3 plus 1 gives us 4. This is a quartet. So for HA, we're going to expect a quartet, right? And which is what we get at whatever part per million. And then for HB, HB is being split by A. There are only two A's, so 2 plus 1 is 3. So for HB, we could expect a triplet. Okay, now where does this whole J value or this coupling constant come in? So this is our HA signal, this is our HB signal. All right, so this J value is the actual measure of um, how far apart these peaks are. All right, so this JAB or this coupling constant is going to define the distance between the peaks and the overall split pattern. All right, so it's going to be the same for all of the splitting for each signal. Okay. We're also going to find the exact same J value, exact same distance for the signal for HB as well, right? So this distance, right, between peaks is going to be the same for protons that are splitting one another, okay? So this distance is equal to this distance over here because HA and HB are interacting and they're sharing that exact same um, J value or coupling constant, okay? Okay, so how would you use that? Well... Most of the peaks that you guys are going to see are going to have similar distances regardless, so it's not going to be necessarily useful. But if you had a signal, let's say, that had a really large splitting or a really large J value, and it was nearby something that had a very small J value, you could tell from the distance between these that these were not interacting with respect to one another. Right, So if there was any question about whether or not this was giving or was interacting and splitting this, then because those distances are, are very, very, very different, you could tell, no, these guys are not, not actually splitting with respect to one another. Right. Another thing to note um, is that these J values are measured in units of frequency, and they are going to be constant regardless of the operating frequency of the instrument that you use, right? So they're going to fall in um, between about 0 to about 20 hertz, depending on the protons. And again, this is not going to change if we use a higher operating frequency instrument, okay? So we use a stronger magnet. Now, what's the big point behind that? Well, this is why we like to use higher operating frequency instruments, because this J value is constant. Let's say, for example, we had a situation where the J value here was, um, let's say, 7 hertz, right? If we were looking at that, that coupling in, let's say, a 60 megahertz instrument, so one of those really low-end, um, very low operating frequency instruments, that J value ends up being about a tenth of a delta unit, right? So let me write that tenth of a delta unit. So because of that, these signals start to overlap with respect to one another, and so you can't make out the entire spectrum. If you were to take that exact same uh, coupling constant and use, like, let's say, a 300 megahertz instrument, then 7 hertz in a 300 megahertz instrument is only, like, you know, a 1% a of a delta unit, right? So because of that, these signals actually get um, to be resolved, and they're not going to overlap with respect to one another. So this is one of those big things about why a higher operating frequency instrument is better. It's because in, in lower operating frequency instruments, these really high J values are going to overlap and we're not going to be able to discern all of the signals because of that. So the higher the operating frequency, the less, um, the less a fraction of a delta unit these J values take up. And so we can essentially look and see all of the various uh, peaks in the spectrum. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, with respect to some of these um, different types of structures, we can find that certain groups are going to have very specific patterns in the NMR spectrum. Right, so for example, um, if we were to draw out an ethyl group, so carbon, carbon, and we were to look at the different protons on an ethyl group, so let's say these guys are HA, and then these guys on the end, we'll call these HB. So HA and HB are non-equivalent with respect to one another, um, but they are equivalent with respect to each other. So HA 
both of these guys are equivalent protons, whereas HB, all three of these guys are equivalent protons, right? So now an ethyl group is going to give a very characteristic pattern in the NMR spectrum. So, for example, if we look at HA, HA is a methylene um, proton. They're methylene protons, so we can expect their chemical shifts at about 1.2 parts per million. Most importantly, though, with respect to the splitting, with respect to multiplicity, they're going to be split by HBs, which we have one, two, three HBs. So three plus one gives us four. So we can expect a quartet, quartet for HA. Whereas for HB, these guys are methyl protons, so we expect them at about 0.9 parts per million. And they're going to be split by HA, of which there is only one, two of it. So two plus one is three. So we can expect a triplet for HB, right? So if we looked at the NMR spectrum, we could expect a triplet at about 0.9 parts per million, right, 1 to 1 to 3. That is upfield comparatively to a quartet, 1 to 2 to 1 to 2. This one needs to be a little higher, right? This guy would integrate into three protons, and this guy would integrate to two, right? So a triplet slightly upfield of a quartet with those types of integration patterns is really indicative of an ethyl group in your molecule. Same thing for isopropyl. So if I draw isopropyl using bond line, it looks like the Y. If we drew it using a Lewis structure instead, we have a methyl group, a methyl group, and then a methine proton. And we can note that this methine proton is um, its own separate thing. It's not equivalent to the other protons here. But these guys, these two methyl protons, these guys are equivalent to each other, right? So these guys are equivalent, right? So they're gonna give rise to one signal. Okay, so what would that signal look like? Well, for these guys, these are all both methyl um, groups, so we can expect them at about 0.9 parts per million. Um, and they're gonna be split by only one other thing, this HA, because again, we're one, two, three sigma bonds away. So we could expect a one plus one, a doublet for this guy. Right, so those are the methyl protons of the isopropyl group. On the other hand, if we looked at the methine proton, um, so for methine, we would expect a 1.7, um, a, a signal at 1.7 parts per million. But now this methine proton is going to be split by all six of these methyl protons here. Right, so our splitting pattern for HA would be 6 plus 1, which is 7. Right, so we could expect... A really, really, really tiny septet that integrated to one proton, right? Which is what we see at about 1.7 parts per million. And that's going to be downfield of a doublet that integrates to six protons at about 0.9 parts per million, right? So tiny, tiny, tiny little septet that is downfield of a doublet is a really big indicator that you're dealing with an isopropyl group. And then finally, for terp-butyl, so terp-butyl, if you remember, is the chicken feet. Um, when we're looking at terp-butyl, we're looking at the protons on the end, these methyl protons. And if I drew one of them on, for terp-butyl, we'll find that uh, we're too far away to be split by anyone. right? So we're one, we're two, we're three, and then the next closest proton that could split any of these guys would be four sigma bonds away. Right, so because of that, there's no splitting. Um, they don't split each other, right? And there are essentially nine of them overall. So what we'd find in a terp-butyl is we'd find a um, signal that would be really, really, really large singlet that would integrate to nine protons at about 0.9 parts per million. So if you ever find a signal in your spectrums that integrates to nine protons, that's a really big indicator that you're dealing with a terp-butyl group. Okay, and so then finally, um, we kind of glanced over this before when I was talking about or doing that problem with expected splitting patterns. But let's say that we had um, a molecule, let's say something like this, where we have um, HB, right? So HB is a signal that we're really interested in this molecule. And it is being split by two different sets of non-equivalent protons, right? So HP right now is being split by um, 
the HCs, right? So we have HCs over here. And it's also being split by um, one, two, three by the HAs over here. Okay, so beforehand, when we were looking at predicting the splitting pattern for HB, I just said, well, count, um, count HC and HA as the same and uh, just add them up, right? So if we were to do that, we'd say one, two, three, four, five, six, or no, five, pardon me. Um, so HB would be uh, have a multiplicity of five plus one, which is six. So we could expect a sextet. Okay, so now, the thing about this is, this is not exactly necessarily true, okay? In reality, and you won't actually ever get into this until you get into, like, really high order uh, NMR spectroscopy, um, but this assumption that we made isn't true because, again, it's going to depend on the coupling constant or the J value of the two different interacting sets of protons, right? So we have two different J values that we can look at here. We've got what we're going to call J B, C, and then we've got what we are going to call J, A, B, okay? So now, the thing is, if J, A, B, and J, B, C are equal, right, or at least fairly close to one another, then we can expect a sextet, right? We can expect that they're all going to interact the same way, and it's going to split the signal into six different peaks, right? Now, if on the other hand, J, A, B, was much larger, let's say, than J, B, C, what we're going to expect is instead something different, okay? So now, J, A, B, this coupling between B and A, that's going to split B into a 1, 2, 3, 3 plus 1 into a quartet, okay? J, B, C, this guy, the interaction between B and C, B is interacting with C. There's only two Cs, so this would split B into a triplet, right? So this is 2 plus 1, 3, okay? Now, if JAB is much larger than JBC, what we're going to find is we're going to find what is called a quartet of triplets, okay? And so this quartet of triplets would look something like this, right, where we have the triplets from the JBC, uh, and overall there's a quartet of them, okay? So now that's if JAB, the coupling constant between A and B, is much larger than the coupling constant between B and C. If, on the other hand, JBC was much larger than the coupling constant between AB, instead of a quartet of triplets, we would expect a triplet of quartets, right? So this is a quartet of triplets this on the other hand is a triplet of quartets and you can actually see this in the NMR spectrum if these uh, coupling constants are fairly different with respect to one another okay so again if AB was bigger it would you would expect to be split into a quartet of triplets or if BC is bigger you expect to be split into a triplet of quartets Okay, so what really happens, especially with a lot of these just like methyl and methylene type protons, is that they're fairly similar with respect to one another. So we can just count them as the same and expect a sextet instead. Also, sometimes what will really happen is we'll get this really ugly multiplet, right? So what I mean by multiplet is like a bunch of signals that you can't necessarily discern what their, um, like their splitting pattern is. Um, so, yes, for our intents and purposes, we're going to assume, especially for a lot of these just plain methyl and methylene protons, that these guys are equal and we can just treat them all the same. We'll expect a sextet for HB. But just note that that's not always the case, and it does depend on the value of the coupling constant between um, the two different sets of non-equivalent protons. Okay, so then finally, um, there's two other little cases that I wanted to bring up, and I'm not going to explain why this is, um, like, why we actually see this. I'm just going to tell you what to expect. Um, so we've been looking at uh, splitting patterns, right? We've been looking at multiplicities. Um, and I just want to mention at the end here that there are some protons that don't actually undergo any type of splitting or coupling. Right, so a good example of that, or the first example that we introduce you to, is alcohol protons. Right, so um, this molecule over here is ethanol, 
we have withdrew out ethanol. We have um, an O, an H, and then we've got two H's here, and then we've got three H's here. Right, so if we're just looking at, okay, what would we expect not knowing anything about alcohol protons not actually doing any splitting pattern, um, we would say, okay, well, HA here um, is one, two, three sigma bonds away from this proton that's on the alcohol, so you would expect it to be split by that, right? So um, you would expect HA to be split by HB. It would also be split by one, two, three. We'll call these guys HCs, okay? And so because of that, you say one, two, three, four, uh, it's going to be split into a quintet, right? Now, unfortunately, you would think that and you would be wrong because these protons on alcohols, so these guys do not split any other signal, okay? So just note that they're not going to be split and they will not split anybody else, okay? So because of that, our HAs here, our HAs, are only going to be split by the HCs over here. So we could expect this guy um, to be 3 plus 1, which is 4. So HA will be a quartet. And then um, HC, HC we could expect to be um, 2 plus 1, a triplet. And then again, they would have their own uh, chemical shift. So HA is alpha to an alcohol. Yeah, alpha to an alcohol, we added on 2.5. So this would be 1.2 plus 2.5. We could expect this about 3.7 parts per million. And then for HC, this is beta to an alcohol. So it's a methyl group, 0.9 plus 1 fifth of 2.5. So 0.5 equals 1.4. And then I also said, well, alcohol protons, they end up being at about 2 to 5, depending. But again, the big signal for this is that it's not going to be split, so it's just going to be a singlet. All right, so if we look at this, we'll find, oh, here is a triplet, which we expected, that integrates to three protons at about 1.4-ish. That may be stretching it a little bit. Here we find a quartet which is what we expected, that integrates to two protons at about 3.7-ish parts per million. And then this last one, one proton not being split a little bit above two, so 2.3. This has to be the alcohol OH. Okay, so again, alcohols, what's the big takeaway? They don't split, so don't look for splitting patterns there. The other one that doesn't have any type of splitting pattern are aldehyde protons. So remember the aldehyde group is a carbonyl with a proton on the end, right? It's this proton that will not be split or will not split anybody else, right? So for example, in this molecule, there are two protons here. We're one, two, three sigma bonds away. It doesn't matter. There's still no splitting between these two. Another big key for aldehyde protons is they show up at around 10 parts per million, and they're probably going to be just by themselves with an integration of one, with no splitting, so there's going to be a singlet. Okay, so just note that. Alcohol, aldehydes, they're not going to actually split your signals. Okay, so now, what's next? Well, we're going to utilize everything, or put together everything that we've learned to draw the expected H1 NMR spectrum for a couple of different molecules. And then we're going to flip that around, and given a spectrum, we're going to draw the molecule, okay? All right, so a couple things to look at with respect to drawing an H1 NMR spectrum. First thing we need to consider is chemical shift, right? So we've talked about how we can predict chemical shifts depending on the electronegative atoms that are around it. We also need to predict the integration, right? And we also need to take into account the multiplicity. So each signal is going to have a chemical shift, it's going to have an integral, and it's going to have a, sh a shape or a multiplicity, okay? All right, so we're going to start out here. On the end, we've got these methyl protons. So H, H, H. They are right now alpha to a carbonyl group, right? So remember, alpha to carbonyl, we're going to add 
one part per million. So for these guys, we'll call these A. For chemical shift, it's a methyl, so 0.9. But again, it is alpha to a carbonyl group, so we end up with 1.9 part per million. So we look at the integration here. Uh, there's one, two, three of them, so we can expect this to be integral three. And then finally, for multiplicity, we are one, two, three, very, very, very far away. Right? So we're not going to see any splitting pattern here. So because of that, we are 0 plus 1, or a singlet. Okay, so now we'll move over. There's no protons here. Uh, no protons here. We do get a proton here. All right, so this is our nice methine proton. So for this guy, we'll call this HB. HB, for chemical shift, it's methine. So we'll have 1.7 to begin with. Now, it is alpha to an ester, right? So this is alpha to an ester. So to that, we're going to add on 3. So we end up with 4.7 parts per million. So that's that. For integration, there's only one of them. So this will integrate to one proton. And now this is that kind of special pattern that you can tell. This is a tert-butyl proton at the end. So for multiplicity... This guy's going to get split by all three of these guys. Not terbutyl. This is isopropyl. All right. So these guys are all different. We'll call them C's. C's, C's, C's. HB is within three sigma bonds away from all the C's. So there are six C's. Six plus one is seven. This is going to be that characteristic uh, septet with an integral of one. Okay. And then finally, so that's HB. Finally, we'll move on to HC. So these guys are all equivalent with respect to one another. Um, so for HC, we'll start with chemical shift. They are all methyl groups. Um, and now if that was alpha to an ester, they're beta to an ester. So we're going to add on one-fifth of that three. Uh, so one-fifth of point six is... 0 0.6, or yeah, one-fifth of 3 is 0 0.6. So we add those together, we get 1.5 parts per million. And then for integration, there are six of them. So there'll be six protons. And then for multiplicity, they're all equivalent to one another, so they're not going to split each other. They're only going to be split by HB, right? So we have 1 plus 1. This is that characteristic doublet that has an integral of six, right? So now we're gonna draw this, we're gonna to attempt to draw this. Um, we're gonna start with the farthest upfield signal, which is our doublet at 1.5. So I'm gonna go ahead and put 1.5 here. I'm gonna draw a doublet as best I can. I'm gonna move down to the next in line, which is a singlet at 1.9. So we'll draw 1.9 here. Draw a singlet there. And then as we move out, the last signal we have is this 4.7. So we can move on down. May not be the best estimate here of where 4.7 is. But here we're going to draw a septet. So I'm going to go ahead and just connect this guy. We've got a 1 to 2 to 3 to 3 to 2 to 10 to 10 to 10. Okay, and so again, to kind of illustrate this, we want to put the integrals on. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Good. This is integrating to 1 proton. This is integrating to 3 protons. And this is integrating to 6 protons, right? So the integral values don't necessarily have to be, like, the most obvious. That the peaks, that the peak height is trying to indicate those. Um, but you should try to draw kind of a a good signal. This doublet's kind of ugly. I've been inspired by my septet, so I'm gonna go ahead and just be a little bit more precise. Okay. Okay, so for each NMR spectrum, each signal is gonna have 
a chemical shift that you should be able to predict. It's going to have an integral that you should be able to predict, and it's going to have a splitting pattern that you should be able to predict. Okay, so now we're going to flip that, and instead of drawing the um, NMR spectrum, we're going to take a spectrum, we're going to take the chemical formula for the molecule, and we're going to try to reconstruct what the molecule actually looks like. Because again, this is the purpose of NMR spectroscopy. It's taking an NMR spectrum, taking the molecular formula, taking other little bits of information, and actually determining what the structure of the molecule is. Okay? Okay, so now in doing this, we're going to utilize um, this guy where we have the C9H10O and it's given proton NMR spectrum as our example. I'm going to walk you through how I go about trying to um, piece these things together. Okay, so there are going to be a couple of steps that you guys are supposed to follow in taking uh, an NMR and taking a chemical formula and reconstructing the um, structure for it. The first step I tell you to do is determine the HDI. So you may think to yourself, well, what's an HDI? I haven't actually defined that, so we're going to define that first. Um, the second, you're going to analyze um, the integrals, specifically um, the integral values here with respect to the actual chemical formula, and look for symmetry. You're then going to try to make fragments out of the various um, multiplicities in the integral values that we've been given, and then you're going to try to assemble those fragments into the overall structure. Okay, so again, I'm going to hopefully illustrate that as I go through um, this example. Okay, so the first step in determining the structure given the proton NMR is determining the um, what is called the HDI or the hydrogen deficiency index, right? So what we're looking for here um, is degrees of saturation or unsaturation in a molecule. So what I mean by unsaturation, it usually tells us whether or not we have a double bond um, or let's say a ring in a molecule because what it's what it's looking for is if you have this many carbons, if everything was perfectly saturated, how many hydrogens should you have, right? And so that's what we're essentially calculating. Um, how many hydrogens are we lacking given that we have a certain amount of carbons, okay? So I'm not going to go into like all the various aspects of this. I'm mainly just going to define it. And so to calculate the HDI, um, what you're going to do is you're going to multiply 2 times the number of carbons in the molecule. You're going to add 2 from it to it, pardon me. Um, and then if there are any nitrogens, you're going to add them in as well. You're then going to subtract the hydrogens, and you're going to subtract the halogens. So this thing at the end is halogens, if there are any halogens in the molecule. Okay, so this is, again, the number. With that, all of these guys' things in the parentheses, you're then going to divide that by 2. Okay, and if you get an HCI that's equal to 0, then the molecule is fully saturated, meaning there are no double bonds, there's no rings. Um, if you get an HCI of 1, that's going to tell you that there is either a double bond or a ring. Um, and then if you get an HDI of 2, there's a lot of different permutations of HDIs of 2, right? That could be two double bonds, that could be a triple bond, it could be two rings or a ring and a double bond. So the higher the value of HDI, the less inf information we're actually going to get from calculating the HDI. So hopefully, you know, if you're calculating HDI, you're going to end up with an HDI of 1, maybe an HDI of 2. The only other helpful one is that if you get an HCI that's greater than 4, this usually indicates the presence of an aromatic ring. And so HCI 4, coupled with some other things, is usually going to indicate the presence of this guy. Greater than 4, pardon me. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate the HCI for this guy. All right, so we have carbon 9H10O. Um, so for HDI, we're going to take one half, um, two times the number of carbons. So the number of carbons here is nine uh, plus two, and then we're going to subtract from it the number of hydrogens, right? So number of hydrogens is 10. This is number of carbons. All the other stuff in that formula was... Um, like nitrogen, we don't have nitrogen here. It was the halogens, we don't have any halogens in here. So this is really all we need to account for is the number of carbons and the number of hydrogens. So when we do this, we get one half 
2 times 9 is 18 plus 2, which is 20. 20 minus 10 gives us 1 half of 10, which gives us 5. So we have an HDI right now of 5. And again, I said, well, that's not very helpful, except if we have an HDI that is greater than 4. That's really indicative that we have um, an aromatic ring present. Um, and so because of that, we're going to assume that there's probably an aromatic ring in this molecule. Okay. Number two, with that, we're going to start to look at our uh, chemical shifts in our, in our proton NMR signal and then also the integrals for them, right? So remember, um, these integrals can sometimes be given to you as actual values, or, or sometimes they're going to give you like the actual number, like, oh, one proton or two protons, etc. Here, we have four different signals, right? And the first signal integrates to 10, the second to 54, the third to 21, and the fourth to 22. To take these values and make them into actual numbers of protons, we're going to divide all of them by the lowest number. So this is 10.2, this is 10.2, and then divided by 10.2. What we end up with is one, so one proton for this signal. We end up with five protons for this signal. Um, for this guy, we'll end up with two protons, and then for this guy, we'll also end up with two protons, okay? So what I mean by looking for symmetry now is when I add up all of these guys, I end up with 10 protons altogether, which is the exact number of protons that I have in my molecule, right? So if instead I had added these up and ended up with 10 and there had been, let's say, 20, then that would have been a big indicator that, oh, this molecule is symmetric, um, and so I need to take in that into account, okay? We don't have to worry about that, though. We have 10 protons, and we only have 10 to get rid of here. So each proton is giving rise to one of these signals. Okay, so now... We're going to look at the actual overall um, little bits that we have here. So a couple things to note. This thing right in the middle. So it's clear to me, um, but it probably isn't clear to you. Anytime you get, again, what I'm going to call a multiplet, where it's really unclear, like they're kind of, I mean, what is that? Like a quartet, a quintet, we can't really tell, um, that hovers about seven parts per million, that is another really big indicator that we have an aromatic ring. Okay, so this has to do with that diamagnetic anisotropy. We also already had a big indicator via our HCI of 5 that this is an aromatic ring. So that's going to be one of our little um, fragments, right? We have an aromatic ring. Now, the integral for the protons in the aromatic ring here is only 5, right? So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this other bit or this other carbon must be bound to something else because there's not a proton here, okay? So we know that, um, you know, five of our protons are going to be present on this ring because of this integral, because there are five of these guys, and that sixth position is going to go out to something else, okay? So now another big helpful hint in what else could possibly be present in this molecule is this one proton out here at about 10 parts per million, all right, so we go back to that diamagnetic, diamagnetic anisotropy. Um, we talked about how the aldehyde proton ends up about 10, and it's fairly indicative that there's an aldehyde proton, right? And again, another helpful hint here is the fact that this integrates to one proton, okay? So this is going to be another fragment, and what helps here, too, is that takes into account the oxygen, right? So we have a fragment now that has included an oxygen that we had to get rid of in our overall structure, um, so that's going to help out. Okay, so now this is good. We have at this point in time accounted for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. And we have nine to get rid of, so there are two more. We've also accounted for um, one, two, three, four, five, six um, hydrogens. And there are ten to get rid of, so we have four more. And then we've accounted for the oxygen, so that guy's gone. Okay. All right, so now if we come back down here, we have two triplets that um, integrate to two, okay? So again, if I just looked at one of these guys, so let's say this triplet, right? So this guy has an integral of two, meaning that I've got a carbon that has two protons on it. We'll call these HBs, okay, um, that are surrounded by 
n plus 1 equals 3, right? Because this is a triplet, we can see 1, 2, 3, right? So my overall um, splitting is 3, and I know that's n plus 1 equals to 3. So n has to be equal to 2, right? So whatever this guy is, it needs to be nearby two other non-equivalent protons, right? So we call this like HC and HC, right? Same thing for this guy. There are two protons, right, that need to be nearby two other non-equivalent protons because, again, N plus 1 for this signal is 3, so there have to be two nearby protons, okay? So because of that, I could propose that this fragment is a methylene group that's nearby another methylene group, right? So this little bit together could be the last little bit to my structure, right? So we'll call this HB, I think that's what I called it down here, HB, HC, HC, right? HC, which would probably be, we'll call this guy, is going to be near that aldehyde. So aldehydes have to end structures because... Um, hydrogen can't bind with anything else, right? So we knew that we had this aldehyde group. We knew it was going to be a terminal position. What am I doing? This guy. Yeah, so this guy has to be an aldehyde group, and we know it has to be terminal. So HC is probably this guy because of that. Again, aldehydes don't couple, so we don't have to worry about that. And then HB, on the other hand, would probably be the thing that's attached to the aromatic ring, right? Right? Because being near a carbonyl would shift it about two, one, uh, I don't know. I forget what there's a little bit. I'm going to have to go back and look at that. Hold on just a second. Yeah, so, yeah, I think HC is the farther one downfield. Um, because, again, for these guys, these would be 1.2 originally. And then we would add on one to account for the carbonyl. Whereas these guys off of the aromatic ring... That only like shifts it like uh to point two or to maybe at the most like I don't know point two point five right so again I'm gonna stick with this is H C and this is H B that's slightly farther up field. All right, but now with that we've got these fragments that we can piece together, right? We knew that the aldehyde had to terminate, so it had to be on the other end of this guy. So the only thing left to put on the end of this guy is this aromatic ring. Right, so now if we can put the pieces together, we're going to have our aromatic ring. This is going to branch out into an ethyl group, or I guess, no, wrong one. Let's try that again. Into, yeah, an ethyl group that terminates in an aldehyde. H double bond oxygen. Okay, so now again, it's important to check to make sure you have everything together. So we do have our one oxygen, so that is off the table. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine carbons, which is what we had before. For hydrogens, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so maybe if I drew this better, it would look better. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Hydrogen to this guy, to this guy. All right, and again, a good check after you put the pieces together is to go back, right, and say, okay, if this was my molecule, what would be the expected spectrum that I could produce from this? Okay. Okay, so now given that, I want you to go ahead and try this one on your own, All right? So now this guy, again, I can already define, has this crazy uh, multiplet down here at about 7, right? So this is what I would define as a multiplet. Um, all the other signals are nice and clear, though. So we've got a triplet here. We've got a triplet here. And then we've got a singlet here. And the singlet's at about two parts per million. I've given you the integral values, and so I want you to try to determine the structure of the C8H10O molecule given the proton NMR spectrum. Video, which ideally you guys watch 
okay? Um, so in the video, we went over a bunch, kind of like the most relevant topic with respect to NMR spectroscopy, which deals with that spin-spin coupling and that multiplicity in our signals, right? Splitting our signals into multiple peaks, okay? So after I talked about that, I started to go into how we can utilize NMR spectrum to determine the overall molecular structure of a compound, okay? So there's a couple of things that you need to be given to be able to do this. The first one is the molecular formula, right? So it'll be really, really, really difficult for you to determine the overall structure of a compound if you don't have the molecular formula for it. So that's going to be number one in what they have to give you, okay? So in our practice problem, I gave you guys this one, but then I didn't go over the answer. So I'm going to start by going over the answer to this today, how you can utilize the spectrum, the NMR spectrum, to determine the actual structure of this C8H10O compound. Okay, so in my video, I talked about the first step in doing this was calculating what was called the HDI, which is called the Hydrogen Deficiency Index. So for this, what we're looking at is the degrees of unsaturation, right? So if a hydrocarbon is fully saturated, it means it has all carbon, hydrogen, carbon, carbon, single bonds, okay? If we don't, if we have a double bond, if we have a ring, that's what we're calculating and that's what we're determining when we're calculating the HDI, okay? So I gave you guys this um, formula for this and I didn't really want to talk about like the how and whys of where we get this formula, but I just wanted to teach you or show you how to utilize it, okay? So to calculate the HDI, we're gonna take one half two times the number of carbon atoms plus two. If there is a nitrogen atom, we're going to add in however many nitrogen atoms there are. We're then going to subtract from that all of the hydrogen as well as any halogen. So X always stood for a halogen, okay? So now this is the entire formula, but a lot of times some of these are not going to be applicable to the actual compound that we're dealing with, okay? So for example, in our structure here, or in our compound here, we don't have a nitrogen, we don't have a halogen. All we have is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And for the HCI, we ignore oxygen entirely, so we don't even have to consider that, okay? So we're going to go ahead and plug in our values here to calculate our HDI for this compound. So we get one half of two times eight, which is the number of carbons in the compound, plus two, and then we're going to subtract from that the number of hydrogens, which is 10, okay? So 2 times 8 is 16, plus 2 is 18, minus 10 is 8, times 1 half gives us an HCI equal to 4, okay? Okay, so this is unfortunate, or kind of unfortunate, right? With respect to HCI, it becomes less helpful if we increase our overall HCI, right? So an HCI of one tells us there's either a double bond or a ring, an HCI of two can be a bunch of different things, an HCI of three can be a lot of different things. The only helpful little hint that we're gonna get from this is the fact that we have an HCI of four. And usually if we have an HCI that is greater or equal to four, that is indicative of a benzene ring. Right, so that is indicative of a nice conjugated ring system, okay? And again, that's if you get an HCI that is greater than or equal to four. So that's number one, okay? Number two, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the integral values to tell us um, whether or not we have any type of symmetry in the molecule or whether or not these signals are actually unique and they're going to distinct different regions of the compound, okay? Now, for this spectrum, they don't give us the nice, easily done integrals, right? We're actually gonna have to determine or reduce these numbers to determine the actual values themselves, okay? So I have an integral of 45, an integral of 18, 19, and nine. What do I need to divide all these guys by to reduce them to their nearest whole number value? The lowest common denominator. Right, so the lowest one, we're gonna divide everyone by. So we'll divide everyone by 9.1, divide everyone by 9.1, divide everyone by 9.1. So for this guy, we get out one, a two, a two, and a five, okay? So again, that's telling us how many protons are actually giving rise to the signal. And we can go ahead and write them over each individual signal like so, okay? Okay, so if we have five and a two and a two and a one, what does that add up to overall? Uh, 16? Wait, 
five, two, two, one? Uh, ten. Ten, right? And so because all of our integrals add up to the actual number of hydrogens that are in the compound, we don't have any symmetry in this compound. These are gonna actually be distinct regions of the compound, okay? That means there's no like axis of symmetry or, or plane of symmetry, mirror of symmetry, anything like that, okay? Okay, so then after we look at the integrals, we're going to start to look at each individual signal and try to make fragments from them, okay? So again, we already know that that HDI of four told us that there's probably gonna be a benzene ring in here. Another really big indicator in this spectrum is this really ugly multiplet. So this is something that we would call a multiplet at about seven parts per million. If you get a really ugly squiggle of stuff that's at about seven parts per million, having an HDI greater than or equal to four, that's a big, big, big indicator that this is our benzene ring. Okay. With that, yes. I'm sorry, um, can you go back one step? You mentioned that there is no line of symmetry because of it's an even number of um, integrals. So let's say that we had the same integral, right? We had five, two, two, and one, uh -huh. okay? So that added up to 10. In our overall compound, the molecular formula, what if we had C16H20O? And all of these only added up to 10. I see. So that's what I mean by symmetry, right? Okay. If they add up to the actual number of hydrogens, then they're distinct. If they add up to um, uh, one half of the actual number of hydrogens, that means that one half of the molecule is gonna be what we're solving for, and we're just gonna mirror it on the other side. Okay. okay, so multiplet with the HCI greater than or equal to four, big indicator is benzene. Another big indicator is that that integral is five, right? How many different hydrogens, or how many different positions in theory would there be on a benzene ring? So if we put everyone out, we have one, two, three, four, five, right? In theory, if it was just benzene, there'd be six, but we know there has to be more because it has to go somewhere, right? So this guy is our five, and we're gonna figure out what's on the other side, what's attached to the rest of this. Sorry, oh. I missed that. Shut up. Could you say it again, please? No. <laughs> so now we're just determining the shapes of each uh, multiplexes? No, so, hold on, yeah. So now we're figuring out what's attached to this, which is gonna essentially be these guys over here. Like what springs off of that benzene? Okay, so this is what I mean by fragments. This is a fragment, it's a piece of our molecule. Now we need to figure out what the other fragments are so that we can piece them together like a puzzle. All right, so now I'm gonna go over to the other side. If I look at my next signal, which we'll call this guy, right? This is a triplet, right? So a triplet that integrates to two protons. So this guy is a triplet that integrates to two protons. Those two protons are gonna be equivalent to one another. So right now, I can already draw the fact that I have a hydrogen and a hydrogen attached to a carbon. These are the two protons that are giving rise to this signal. The fact that it's a triplet tells me who's nearby or how many protons are nearby that are non-equivalent, right? So again, if I'm using n plus one and getting three, what is it? What is the number of nearby non-equivalent protons? How many integers have some So right here, if n plus one is equal to three for this guy, what is n? Two. Two, right? So this tells me that there are two nearby non-equivalent protons, okay? Same thing for this guy. It's another integral of two, meaning that I have another piece of this guy. So there's two protons giving rise to this signal. Again, though, it's a triplet, right? So this is also a triplet. So n plus one is equal to three. How many nearby non-equivalent protons are there for this? Also two. also two, okay? Finally, we get to the end, right? The end, we have a singlet, right? A singlet by itself singlet that is at a chemical shift at about two. The other thing to note about this molecule, what else is in here that we haven't talked about? We talked about some, some of the carbons. If we think about that too right now, there are eight carbons. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, 
Now we have seven and eight accounted for. So what is the other atom that we haven't dealt with yet? Oxygen. Oxygen, okay? So this is the big indicator. I talked about some of these protons on distinct functional groups not having any type of coupling, right? So never being split and never splitting anyone else. There were only two examples that I gave of that. What was one of them? Uh, OH, alcohol, and alcohols. Alcohols, right? Alcohols and aldehydes, and for this guy, because there is, because we've already kind of gotten rid of the HDI of four with the benzene, this is a big indicator that this is the proton on an, on an alcohol. Again, because it's at two, alcohols show up about two to five, whereas aldehydes would be all the way out to 10 parts per million, okay? Okay, so those are my pieces, right? I've got a benzene that's gotta attach to something else it's got to attach to something else. It's got to end in an alcohol because an alcohol has to terminate the molecule. It can't keep going because nothing else can attach to hydrogen. Okay, so now how should I piece this together to get my overall compound? So we know we're going to start with benzene or our aromatic compound. This is going to branch off to a carbon, most likely, right? It can't end in an alcohol. How many other carbons do I have? I have one carbon here. I have one carbon here, right? So one carbon, one carbon that terminates in our OH. And if we look at this and say that this is what we'll call HA, and these guys are what we call HB, if I were to predict the signal for HB, what would I get? What would be the multiplicity of it? How many nearby non-equivalent protons are within two to three sigma bonds from those guys? Two. Just two, right? What would they give? Uh, a triplet, right? Same thing for this guy. How many nearby non-equivalent protons are within two to three sigma bonds away from this? Two. It's two. What would you expect to see? A triplet, right? A little bit farther upfield compared to this guy because this is attached directly to an alcohol. It's alpha to an alcohol, whereas this guy is beta to an alcohol, okay? What do we get? We get a triplet at three, a triplet at four-ish, which is what we'd expect. We get our OH, that accounts for our signal down here at two, and then we've got our benzene ring that accounts for our signal out here. A little bit of this deals with something called carbon-13 NMR. So just a reminder, the most abundant isotope of carbon is carbon-12. This has six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus, right? And what was our um, necessity to be NMR active. It has to be odd numbers. An odd number, right? So the neutrons and protons have to add up to an odd number. Carbon-12 is NMR inactive, so we can't use carbon-12, which is the majority of the carbon atoms in our molecules, right? The other isotope of carbon is carbon-13, which has six protons and seven neutrons, okay? So these guys do add up to an odd number, so carbon-13 is NMR active. Now, the problem is, is that carbon-13 is only 1.1% abundant, meaning out of every 100 carbon atoms, there's only one that actually is carbon-13 in its nucleus, okay? Now, most of you would say, okay, well, how are we going to use that? What are we going to do with that? But if you think about the overwhelming number of molecules that we deal with, right? Again, how much is a mole? It's like 10 to the 23rd molecules, right? One out of every hundred is still a significant number of carbon nuclei that are actually in our molecules, okay? So even though it is not very high in percent abundance, it is still present and we can still use it, okay? Now, a couple of things that are different, right? Number one, when we're dealing with carbon-13 NMR, all of the basic ideas are the exact same, okay? Except we're looking at carbon nuclei and we're not looking at hydrogens anymore, okay? Now, in terms of proton NMR, for each signal that we had in our proton NMR spectrum, they had three different characteristics, right? The first one was the number of signals and their chemical shift, right? The second was their integral value, and the third was their spin-spin coupling or that multiplicity, okay? That's proton NMR. For carbon-13 NMR, it's going to be much less useful because essentially, we do a bunch of things to get rid of the multiplicity, so they're all just going to end up as singlets, and we also can't do anything with the integral values. 
So comparatively to proton NMR, carbon-13 NMR, the only thing we can really use anything out of is just the chemical shift in the actual number of signals. Okay, so this is the only thing that we're actually going to utilize in carbon-13 NMR. Another big difference for carbon-13 is if we think about proton NMR, what were it's kind of like the brackets for our parts per million for our chemical shifts? It was like zero all the way out to like 12-ish maybe. So carbon NMR is different. It goes from zero all the way out to 220 parts per million. So the spectrum actually looks a little bit different. It's much more spread out. But again, again finding signals in this overall spectrum depends on the actual um, electronegative groups attached to the carbon as well as how many double bonds, et cetera, are actually there. Okay, so we can expect any type of carbon that just has single bonds in between 0 and 50, anything attached to nitrogen, oxygen, or carbon-carbon triple bond between 50 and 100, and then double bonds between 100 and 150, and then double bonds to oxygen between 150 and 220. Okay, so again, it's not super informative. It really is just going to give us an idea of how many distinct carbons are in the overall molecule. Okay, so we'll go ahead and finish with this one. Again, I don't focus too much on carbon NMR um, because really the only thing that you're going to pay attention to in carbon NMR is the chemical shift. Um, and then how many signals you get, that'll tell you how many non or chemically non-equivalent carbons there are in the molecule. Um, but we're not looking at any type of splitting pattern and we're also not looking at any integration with these guys. So the only thing that we can really obtain from a carbon-13 NMR is just predictive chemical shifts and... Um, the number of carbons that are uh, chemically non-equivalent. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and finish up with this one. So in this one, I ask you to predict the number of signals and their chemical shifts in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum for the following molecule, right? So I'm looking for number one, um, identify all of the chemically non-equivalent carbons, so number of signals. And then number two, I also want you to tell me what their approximate chemical shifts are. Um, and again, that's just going back to that chart on the previous slide, right? So for example, for um, a carbon that has a double bond to an oxygen, when I mean like approximate chemical shift, we saw that that was gonna be between 1500 and 2200 ppm. And so that's, that's the range that I'm kind of looking for. If you saw a carbon that had a double bond to an oxygen, you would predict approximately 15 to 2200 uh, ppm. Okay, let's try this and then come back and we'll go over the answers. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to identify the number of chemically non-equivalent carbons. So we're looking for the number of chemicals or number of signals, pardon me, um, in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. Um, so this is a little bit different and it's going to kind of, I don't know, it's going to maybe make you have to rethink what you've been looking at thus far, right? So for um, proton NMR, we're always looking at H's, we're always looking at hydrogens or protons, right? But now we're looking at carbons, right? So um, number one, I'm just going to go ahead and identify all of the carbons that I have in the molecule. So I've got a carbon here, I've got a carbon here, carbon, 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 carbon. Uh, so potentially there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different signals. But now when we're looking for chemical equivalency, we're going to use the same type of um, rules that we learned with respect to protons, right? So um, we had both um, an antiotopic protons as well as, as, well as uh, homotopic protons. Okay, so we're looking for a similar type of thing here, right? So number one, first off, I'm looking for a plane of symmetry in this molecule. Um, if I'm wanting to identify... Um, an antiotopic carbons now, or I'm looking for an axis of rotation or an axis of symmetry in this molecule if I'm looking for homotopic carbons now, right? So notice that if we took like a sphere and we speared this molecule right down this carbon oxygen bond and we rotated this guy 180 degrees, 
while all our, our eyes were closed and we opened our eyes again, um, we would not have been able to tell that we did that, right? So because of that, this guy does have an axis of symmetry. Um, and so symmetry. Um, and so because of that, this guy is chemically equivalent with this guy. This guy is chemically equivalent with this guy. This guy with this guy, this guy with this guy, and this guy's kind of just by himself, okay? So essentially what we have here is we'll call this A, A, we have B, B, we have C, C, we have D, D, and then we have E. Okay, so then after that, because of that axis of symmetry, we're only going to expect five different signals um, in this spectrum. Now we're going to try to predict where exactly they're going to be at. Um, so for carbon A, um, so this guy, this carbon A, essentially is only carbon um, hydrogen and carbon carbon single bonds, right? So if we go back to that. Um, overall kind of predictive spectrum for carbon single bonds we're going to predict that between zero and 50 parts per million um same thing for carbon b's again these guys are just carbon um carbon single bonds and then carbon hydrogen single bonds so again we would expect this at zero to 50. now for carbon c now we've got a carbon carbon double bond um, and so we would expect that between 100 and 150. For carbon D, similar thing. We'd expect that between 100 and 150. And then for carbon E, carbon E is that carbon oxygen double bond, which we expected between 150 and 200. And so with respect to carbon NMR, the only thing we're going to be asking you guys about is um, number of chemically equivalent or non-equivalent carbons, probably being able to recognize um, how many signals you would expect in the carbon-13 spectrum, and maybe just kind of have an idea of the regions you would expect to see certain carbons in the spectrum.